This rather splendid pile is called Brodsworth Hall. It's just outside Doncaster. It was built in 1860. These days, it's owned by English Heritage. They took it over in the 1990s, and it's left pretty much exactly as they found it. In its heyday, Brodsworth would have had about 15 indoor servants, and they'd have worked in their own little empire through here. One of the biggest changes in Britain in the last century or so has been the decline in domestic service. In 1900, 800,000 households employed at least one servant. A quarter of the female workforce was servants. But what was life like for those millions toiling below stairs or behind the green baize door? A new book, Servants, by Lucy Lethbridge, a downstairs view of 20th century Britain, aims to tell us. We invited her here to Brodsworth so we could meet the author. So, Lucy Lethbridge, here we are at uh, Brodsworth, which I suppose is the kind of place that most people, most people would think of when we talk about servants. It's a great big house built in the 1860s, would have had about 15 staff. And my word, they had to work hard. They, they certainly did. I mean, a kitchen this size would have employed perhaps a cook and three, perhaps even four scullery maids. The scullery maids being most of their time elbow deep in greasy water, scouring pans, keeping this, this vast array of, of kitchen implements, clean, polished, hygienic, um, blacking the stove. One of the things they tried to do at Brodsworth, the English Heritage took this house over in the 1980s and they tried to leave it pretty much as it was. And just around the corner, there is a butler's pantry. So let's go and have a look at that. Now, butlers were the sort of elite of domestic servants, weren't they? And they had their own little realm. What sort of things would have happened in a butler's pantry like this? Well, this was really the administrative hub. Uh, the butler was uh, the manager of the household, the sort of part of familias of all the other servants. And so he would have kept, for example, the keys to the wine cupboard. That was very crucial in the butler's life. And in fact, it was a well-known... Um, fact about butlers that they were very often alcoholic and insurance companies would often refuse to insure them. Now one of the things you can see here at Brodsworth is the servants' bedrooms, there's old corridor yes. of them, and pretty spartan they are too. Up in the housekeeper's room there is a bell on her bedside table. I think that would be for summoning a servant to come and bring her a cup of tea or uh, to, to bring her, her even her breakfast. So she was being waited on by the juniors? Yes. It was a skilled job, butlering. I've been rooting around in the archives and I found a 1939 British Pathé film about butlering school, butler's school, which makes that point very clearly. Principal Bretson of a London school for budding butlers and other domestic staff shows the right way to lay the table. Everything has its proper place and a servant who knows his place keeps it longer when he learns where that proper place is. Now, before there were such things as butler's schools, how did servants learn their trade? Well, they usually went in as under-servants. So a butler, for example, a male servant, would probably start off as a hall boy who slept in the hall, literally, and uh, polished the boots. It was a sort of odd job boy. But he would gradually, uh, if he was good at it, he would work his way up through being, say, a second footman to becoming a first footman, and then possibly, in a very large house, an under-butler, if there was such a thing, and then ending up as the butler, which is really was a very well-paid job by um, service jobs of the time, and you got large tips, and you were, in the world in which you moved, you were very highly respected. The status was often quite low, particularly among other workers. I mean, parlour maids yes. and housemaids say, you know, they would go out in the street and other people would shout skivvy at them and flunky. Yes, I think this is one of the more poignant aspects of the servant's life, is that at a, particularly at a time, at the beginning of the 20th century, when the... Um, working class was increasingly politically mobilised. Um, servants were regarded as, and probably rightly, as for the most part conservative, underpinning a class system which was, uh, which was loathsome and corrupt. And so that they were, they were despised by their peers and often felt it to be um, a dishonour to go into service. Now this is the dining room at Broadsworth, so we've come into the upstairs part from downstairs, as it were. Um, they often behaved extraordinarily badly, the employers, didn't they? Unbelievable selfishness. 
Well, yes, I think that there was a tradition of assuming that servants uh, were not possessed of the same sensitivities as one would be, one would have oneself. And so there are all sorts of stories of, uh, well, one particularly I enjoy about the employer who used to uh, give his servants a Christmas pudding for Christmas and then take back the sixpence that was in it to use the next year. Now, in some ways, we, we're being rather misleading because most servants did not work in big houses like these. Most servants worked in middle class or even lower middle class homes, uh, much, much smaller, places where you might have just one or two servants, and their lot, if anything, was even worse, wasn't it? Their, their lot was a great deal worse. I mean, there was something to be said if you came from a poor family and coming to work in a large country house. Uh, where you've got probably better food, for example, than you'd ever eaten before. But in the middle-class home, where um, whether your employer was scrimping and saving uh, to retain, say, one maid-of-all-work, it was very, very tough. In the morning, they would be the housemaid scrubbing away and making lunch. And in the afternoon, they would be the parlour maid. They'd quickly change into a black-and-white uniform to open the door to callers. It was a charade, really, on behalf of the middle classes. It was a charade of having a staff when, you, in fact, you had one very overworked 14-year-old. One of the things that changed all this was changing middle-class incomes. But the, the other thing, particularly, was war. The First World War and the Second World War had a tremendously disruptive effect. I found a couple of stills in the BBC's archive of publicising a radio programme in 1942 called Miss Morgan Does Her Bit. And Barbara Morgan, she's 20, she's been five years, so in other words, from the age of 15, as a, a cook in a household in London, and she's gone off to work in a munitions factory. And most of the women who left domestic service to do that in World War II never went back to it, did they? It was the end. It really was the final blow uh, for the sort of domestic service that we saw in houses like this. Lucy Lesbridge, thank you very much.